All right. So um, today's session is on Fabric Bot. Um, it's one of the core important topics of uh, CCR data center examination. We'll be seeing how it works, um, how it's configured, what are the different um, uh, aspects of uh, Fabric Bot uh, fundamentals, how it behaves, um, um, how the control plane or the data plane functions. We'll be seeing all that, right? If you have any questions, just um, stop me, or if you feel like I'm going too fast, just let me know. All right, so today's agenda is we'll be discussing on how the traditional data centers used to look like, uh, what were the limitations, um, and how Fabric Path is a solution to um, the data centers. Um, one, one key question always come around is why are we um, even uh, discussing about uh, or what really is important in data center design or what is it really common in data center design? So among the discussions, um, most of the time uh, what comes out is um, the layer two is one of the key components that plays the most vital role in the data center designs, right? So we'll be discussing a bit on that and uh, we'll be seeing uh, how Fabric Path uh, functions, um, uh, what are the um, different things that we need to uh, look into, how it's configured. We'll also have a demonstration session uh, for Fabric Path. So uh, let's see how it goes. All right, so traditional data center designs, right? So traditionally, um, all the data center designs um, are were segregated based on uh, different part sections, right? Um, as I told, um, most of the features or the benefits of um, that we can see or um, that are generally used across data center designs is um, the most important and the vital is the layer two features, right? Because of layer two, um, there are certain reasons why we choose layer two or why is it important in the data center. Some of the reasons are like, I mean, it's, it's very simple. It's almost plug and play. You attach a switch to the network, uh, STP comes into play and, and it um, does its, um, uh, runs its algorithm, does a blocking or um, makes the forwarding decisions, right? Um, again, no addressing is required. It's easy for, uh, it makes it easier for provisioning servers in the data center. Um, it also helps um, with uh, the mobility over the virtual machines, right? Because you have a layer two domain and uh, it doesn't matter where you are moving within um, a virtual machine within that domain or even for a different domain itself within that same uh, data center um, uh, location, right? So um, it helps in that as well. Um, also, a lot of protocols rely on the layer two functionality. So uh, even a layer, a layer three protocols, um, and most of the times, uh, and most of them uh, rely on the layer two. So if your layer two isn't there, layer three isn't going to work, right? So um, in each layer data center design, well, the problem with the older traditional designs was all the benefits of the layer two features were, was segregated only to the pod itself. So whatever the benefits you had, you could only were were only limited to a particular um, data center location or the segment that was created for that part, right? What is the alternate solution to this? Um, is you expand the layer two network. So bringing on all the parts together and creating a big, big STP network, but that again has its own challenges. Now, what are the challenges? Now, some of the challenges are the, and the biggest challenge is with the STP, right? The convergence with the STP is not very scalable and it's not very smooth, right? Um, lo with, because of the STP, a lot of the times in the data center or in the layer two environments, there are chances of creating um, a loop in one a loop kind of situation, which actually creates a lot of problems within the layer two domain and causes um, disruptive behavior. Right. So um, again, apart from that, um, MAC address table is one of the uh, limitations because uh, with the number of hosts, you have to scale the number of uh, uh, MAC addresses supported within the MAC table. Now, every device within the layer two topology has to maintain that amount of MAC table for to 
do the forwarding and the lookups, right? Um, tree topology. The tree topology, you had a limitation on the bandwidth, and obviously it was, um, um, it also introduces the suboptimal paths, which causes uh, you know uh, some delay or, or latency in the uh, in the forwarding. Apart from that, it doesn't provide you with the ECMP features, equal cost multipath features. So you cannot do um, um, I mean you cannot share traffic across multiple links, right? So again, um, the forwarding is slow. Um, most of the time, uh, for STP to work properly, the flooding has to uh, be enabled, right? And with the flooding in the n whole network, really uh, causes a lot of impact because sometimes you see broadcast storms, you can you can see unicast storms. Even if you're l running multicast, you can uh, see multicast storms, right? But generally talking about the layer two, you are the the um, the layer two network is prone to uh, such kind of storm attacks and and impacts that really impacts the whole network because. If uh, the storm is affecting one node, it is definitely going to affect the other nodes uh, because of how the STP and the MAC table flooding works. Right. Um, also, uh, as I mentioned, if one node is impacted, it is going to impact uh, multiple nodes within the network. So it's going to create a bigger impact and causing a bigger outages in the production environment. Right. Um, the solution to this that uh, Cisco has come up with is the fabric path, right? Um, there are other technologies as well which works uh, similar to fabric path. I can name them, uh, but uh, we are not going to much into discussions of those because they um, work side in side with fabric path as well. Um, uh, technologies like Trill, uh, which is um, um, uh, uh, a technology which is recently boosting up a lot. Uh, apart from that, uh, nowadays we have features like uh, Fabric Path or VPC, uh, which are introduced in the data center designs. They have their own benefits, but uh, Fabric Path um, is one protocol or one feature that actually works based on, or which provides the functionality or the features and the benefits of both Layer 2 and Layer 3. Right, so we'll see how that works. All right, so Fabric Path, um, as I said, it provides the features of both Layer 2 and Layer 3. So what are the benefits of Layer 2 that we discussed? It's plug and play, easy to configure. You have flexibility of provisioning uh, virtual machines or moving, adding or removing host or uh, mobility across uh, the data center. That, those are the f features that we, benefits that we get out of uh, switching mechanism. With the routing principles, uh, we get the faster convergence, right? Uh, more scalability. Apart from that, we have uh, ECMP path features. Now, Fabric Path provides both of these features. How? Because Fabric Path has its control plane running based on um, IS, layer two ISIS, right? You don't need to configure it. It's all automatic. Um, it takes care of the routing and provides you with um, ECMP features. So in order to reach a particular location, you will have multiple paths to go around and um, uh, route the traffic accordingly, right? Any questions? Okay. I'll continue. All right. So uh, the fabric path, uh, uh, there are different terminologies that we need to keep that in mind or uh, are mostly helpful when we are talking in terms of fabric path uh, designs. Uh, the first is the fabric path, um, the spine switch. The spine switch are more like um, uh, the core switches uh, in the in the data center, right? So f spine switch only provides uh, fabric path nodes to fabric path nodes connectivity. They do not connect to any layer two networks like uh, any other switches which are not part of um, um, fabric path, right? They only connect to the fabric path nodes. Then there's a leaf switch, which connects to the fabric path core, but at the same time, it also connects to the classical Ethernet environment that is where you can run STP or any other layer two protocol for that matter, 
right? Um, you have uh, the fabric path uh, um, edge ports, which are uh, towards the classical Ethernet, and you have the fabric path core ports, which are towards the spine switches. Uh, these ports are generally um, that we call on uh, the leaf switch, right? Uh, on the spine switches, we only have the core ports, nothing else. Within the core fabric, you run ISIS. Here you can run STP or MST, uh, whatever you want to run, right? Right? So what happens there? Uh, the classical Ethernet environments sends regular Ethernet-based frames to run STP to Mac learning and, and all the populating the Mac edges tables. On the spine switch side or towards um, the core side, um, it only understands the fabric path frame. It does not understand any Mac. It does not maintain any Mac tables. It does not uh, do uh, run STP. It only maintains its own routing table computed by ISIS, right? And as I said again, you don't need to configure ISIS. It's all automatic, right? So how fabric path works? Um, now, fabric path, uh, what happens is when a switch or when a host sends a frame um, or a packet uh, sourcing from um, to in order to reach from A to B, right, this frame reaches the leaf switch where this packet gets encapsulated within the fabric path frame, right? Um, and based on the routing decision within the fabric path core, it is then forwarded towards the destination switch or the leaf switch where the other host resides. And that is how the fabric path uh, forwarding takes place. Um, it is it, it, within the core, it runs its own shortest path algorithm to understand which is the most shortest path to the destination leaf switch. And based on that, um, and remember, it is not going to make the decision based on uh, the MAC address. It is going to make the decision based on the switch ID of the destination switch where the uh, destination MAC address resides. Now, I'll explain you um, in a whiteboard, on a whiteboard, how that works, but we'll, we'll do that uh, further later during the presentation, okay? All right. So in the control plane, uh, what we are running is um, the ISIS, right? It is based on um, the uh, ISO IEC 10589 um, um, standard. Uh, apart from that, it's it's just a layer two ISIS. It's it's not even a layer three ISIS, so you don't even need to um, um, uh, remember that. But yes, you can look into um, the routing table of the fabric path using the show fabric path ISIS route uh, commands to understand how the routing looks like and which paths are being taken or which parts are available to the node in order to forward the traffic. Right. Uh, also, um, the control plane uh, provides you with ECMP features because it's running on layer two ISIS. So ISIS uh, uh, using its link state pro features and algorithm, um, it's providing you with the ECMP features and provides you with all the paths that are available to you to reach a certain destination. So if you see the fabric path routing table, you will notice that on switch 100, switch ID 100, you have four paths in order to reach switch ID 400, right? You have a path L1, you have a path L2, you have a path L3 and L4, right? From here, uh, they can choose among the best path to um, go to the destination of switch ID 400. And you, they can also do ECMP if the costs are equal, right? Um, for any uh, switch IDs, you will be able to see that uh, it's providing its uh, interface uh, which are available to you, and you will be able to see their metrics as well in the command I told you, show fabric path ISI route, right? So um, generally, all the routing um, uh, decisions are taken by the ISIS, and, and uh, you have no control except for changing the metrics. You have no control on the decision making. Um, because it's all um, decided upon the shortest path. Unless you modify the metric or play with the metric, yes, you can control that. 
but apart from that now right any questions okay So just to um, just to further clarify, so what happens is within the control plane, um, uh, what the switches does is they send a layer to ISIS update to and forth to each fabric nodes um, to communicate and share their um, <clears throat> information across, right? So if you have like um, um, uh, this port is connected to a C port, right? Um, all the information will be shared using the ISIS update, right? And thus, no STP is required within the core because all the update is going via the ISIS. So you're replacing um, the STP from the core itself and you're expanding your layer to domain. And for that reason, only this switch, and suppose their host is here, B, and this side you have a host, A, only these two switches are the ones who need to know the MAC address of the locally connected host. No other device in the network needs to know that. All these devices only care about the ISIS um, or the uh, fabric path switch IDs, and they do their forwarding decisions only based on that, nothing else. Right? Uh, also, um, um, you might not find that in the presentation, but um, I just want to let you know that within the fabric path topology, um, you since it's running ISIS, you have uh, the capability of managing multiple topologies. Like you can have a certain topology, say for, let me remove this up, right? So you can have a topology from this side to this side, right? This side to this side, this side to this side, this side to this side, right? And suppose there's one more switch over here. You can run a separate topology on this side. So make it empty multi-topology one and multi-topology zero. You can have two different topologies. Right, and they can maintain their own forwarding decision. The same way like you have with ISIS, right? You have the multi-topology capabilities. So you have um, the same features available in uh, Fabric Path um, as well. Right, any questions? All right. Yeah. So continuing with the data plane. Now, the data plane is very interesting. Um, so as I was telling you, um, as the host A sends a, a frame, for, so MAC A to MAC B as the destination, right? Um, in the fabric path core, it is not seen as um, the MAC frame or the layer to frame. What it is seen as is it's A connected to B, this is encapsulated, between within the outer header, uh, and here it says, I want to go from switch 100 to switch 300 or 200 for that matter, right? Wherever it wants to go, right? So like you see here. And it will make the forwarding decisions based on its fabric path routing table, right? So whatever the control plane has learned based on that, the, for the data plane, the association uh, MAC address um, I mean, the, the edge devices only uh, maintains the association of the MAC addresses and the switch IDs uh, to help forward or map the traffic from one end point to the other end point to, uh, to forward the packet to the right destination, right? Um, apart from that, uh, only the um, ISIS is uh, doing the forwarding decisions. Now, if there are multiple paths, um, the control, uh, based on the control plane, the forwarding will take place accordingly. Right. 
So uh, how does the fabric path frame look like? So uh, this is the layer two payload or, or the layer two frame, right? Classical Ethernet. Now this is actually get uh, encapsulated within uh, the fabric path frame where the fabric path frame has the outer destination address, the outer source address, the FP tag, and the CRC, right? Now, how, what really the fabric path frame has, right? So the outer destination address contains the end node ID, uh, the UL bit, the IJ bit, end node ID again, um, RSVD, these are the reserved. Um, so most of the common ones which come into use are the switch ID, the subswitch ID, the LID, right? Uh, the subswitch ID is generally used when you're running VPC plus. Oh, sorry. Right? Otherwise, this the subswitch ID value is always set to zero. If you are running VPC plus, it's only then this uh, value is going to change. Uh, the switch ID is actually based on um, now. If the destination uh, switch ID is a value, say 200, this value will be changed. Um, now the LID, uh, I'm going to discuss in more detail. It is um, the LID actually identifies the destination of the source interface or the source interface, right? Now, um, where it needs to go, where is it coming from, all that is maintained uh, via this um, LID. Uh, the FP tag is also one of the important features or the important uh, part of the frame because this really helps you with the forwarding decisions. Uh, note that the fabric path Ethernet type is 0 cross 8903. So if you do some kind of sniffer capture within uh, the fabric path topology or within your network, right, and you capture the frames, if you see the Ethernet type as 0 cross 8903, that means it is a fabric path frame. Right. So apart from that, you can see a TTL bit. Now remember that uh, the TTL bit here is the mechanism or the way they are trying to uh, avoid any kind of loop situations. Right. I'm going to discuss more on how it actually works on the loop. So um, um, say for uh, there's a switch here, right? There's a switch here and there's a switch here and they're running a uh, fabric path over here. So what happens is um, the frame goes from here with a TTL of three, right? From here, um, oh, so TTL of two, right? So here it receives the TTL of two and follows the frame. Now the TTL is decremented at every hop in the, in the topology. Now when it reaches here, it is already at TTL one, right? And so when the frame is again trying to get forwarded to this node back over here, it says stop because the TTL is zero and drop the frame. So this is how it's actually avoiding the loop. It's the same mechanism how it's uh, how we avoid the loop in, in the routing environments, right? So with the help of TTLs. So the same way it's being done over here as well. All right. So um, it's really important to understand what are the contents of um, the fabric path uh, frame because generally in production environments when we troubleshoot it, uh, if we know how to read um, the fabric path frames, it becomes more easier to um, uh, troubleshoot sometimes routing issues in the fabric path network. Though there are very less scenarios wherein it may run into issues, but yeah, I mean, it definitely helps to understand the um, how the fabric path frames look like, All right? So, what is LID? Now, um, LID is one feature or or one um, value which removes the need for having uh, or which removes the need for Mac learning on the core ports, right? Because it keeps a tab on what is the source interface and what is the destination interface, right? If you don't have the LID, you will have to uh, rely on the MAC addresses to understand where the frame needs to go and do MAC lookups and all that stuff. But with LID, you completely, um, you, what, what you really do is you encode the MAC address into the fabric pad MAC and MAC frames, right? 
So um, this is um, uh, again uh, logically signi uh, locally significant, and and it is not um, something um, which is um, um, common to uh, multiple nodes within the network, right? So. Uh, whatever the value of LID is, uh, it may be locally, and you can see that value based on the fabric path uh, routing table or the MAC address table as well. So if you do a show MAC address, uh, MAC address hyphen table and uh, look for a particular MAC addresses, you might see that um, the entries might be in the format of the SID, the switch ID, the sub-switch ID, and the LID format, right? So you need to remember this format. Um, this is uh, mostly used in fabric path environments to troubleshoot uh, where the fabric, or where the MAC is being learned and where it's being forwarded within the fabric path domain. Right. Um, other important aspect uh, or the um, value that is important is the F tag. It's a unique 10-bit number um, which is used for identifying the topology or the distribution tree. Um, it's again uh, integrated within the fabric path frame itself, um, <clears throat> and and it's generally automatically set. So uh, for unique unique as packets identifies which are fabric path ISS topology to use, right? Um, now you might have different kind of frames like broadcast, multicast, unknown unicast. And based on those different kinds of frames, the different F tag values are set. Right. So, based on the F tag values, the device, uh, the edge device, understands what kind of forwarding it needs to be done and where it needs to be done, and what um, processing has to be done on the packet to make the further forwarding happen within the fabric path topology. All right. Now. <clears throat> The regular Ethernet VLANs um, we we have been reading in in all the switching environments, and we we have been doing that in routing and switching, right? Now with the fabric path, the regular Ethernet uh, VLANs are no more supported, right? So to have the VLANs being able or capable of getting forwarded or being um, learned across the fabric path uh, uh, topology is you need to enable the mode fabric path for that particular VLAN. Now, um, if you go into the VLAN and you do uh, do not set any mode, it is by default the classical Ethernet frame of based VLAN. But if you set the mode to fabric path, now that VLAN will understand that it needs um, or it will be treated by the fabric path topology and not by the classical or the traditional STP based topology. Or, or the forwarding will be based on fabric path itself, right? Um, for fabric path, the F series modules uh, are supported for the edge and the core ports. Uh, for uh, the Nexus 5500, um, uh, you don't need specific modules. It, it's supported uh, on that platform. Um, you only need to enable the feature fabric path in order to use uh, fabric path um, uh, within the core topology. Right. So uh, if you do show feature, pipe include fabric path, you will be able to, see, uh, you will see that it is disabled by default. And you need to enable it, right? ECMP. Now, um, ECMP is again taken care by uh, the um, control plane ISIS, right? Um, the maximum number it supposes is up to 256 links uh, within the topology, and it is between the two edge devices. Note that you still have control over the maximum number of multipathing that you need to. So what you can do is you can go to um, um, fabric path domain default, right? And you can set the uh, maximum paths as the number of maximum paths that you want to have within the topology, right? So um, based on your design, you can control the number of multipaths that you need to have, um, but otherwise um, it will uh, uh, do the 
uh, default uh, multipathing within the core on all the available links. I don't recall on top of my head if there's any default value of the number of uh, um, uh, equal caught multipath links, but it should be 16, I guess. Um, um, I'll check that and let you know. Okay. All right, so any questions so far? Um, is there a, do we have to identify spine uh, switches as spine switches or there's no identification? Just be, just no. when they are, when you have the core and the uh, edge, then that's how, well that's what, that's what you identify. So you, you don't really need to identify the spine switches. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the, the switches which do not have uh, um, the C ports are generally the spine ports, uh, the spine switches. Which ports? Right, uh, the C ports okay. connected uh, to the uh, classical edge. Ethernet environment. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Right. So, <laughs> in, in in the edge ports, you have two kinds of ports, right? The the FP core ports. Mm -hmm. Right, and the C ports. Okay. Now the C ports are connecting to the classical Ethernet switches or the host, and uh, the FP ports are connecting towards the core. So any device which is only having um, the connectivity to other fabric path uh, devices is the spine switch, right? So if you okay. see these two devices, it will only have connectivity to this and this. It is not going to have, and if it's going to have a connectivity to a C device, then it is not a spine switch. It is uh, a edge leaf. I mean, it's a leaf switch. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. So um, I was also thinking of uh, taking a moment to explain uh, on um, how the forwarding works uh, in Fabric Path. Right. Uh, give me a moment. Let me pull up. Another window. Right. Um, are you guys able to see my screen? Yes. Okay. So uh, let me draw a small topology to help you explain how the actual forwarding will look like from host A to host B. Okay. So uh, make it 100. So this is how the topology will look like, and the hosts are connected over here, A and B. Now what happens is the host A will send a frame uh, or a packet with the source MAC of A, right? The destination MAC as FF the broadcast, because right now it doesn't know the MAC address of the destination device and obviously the payload, right? Now, it is received by the switch 100, switch ID 100, right? What it does is it populates its MAC table, so makes it entry uh, in the MAC table as um, MAC table. It says, this is host A, right? This is the MAC address of host A, and it's learned over the interface, say, E1 slash 1. Okay, A1 slash 1, right? 
So it will populate its MAC address. Now, since this is an edge device, what it will do is it will uh, it will treat the broadcast as um, that. Okay, over here I have say port channel ten, PO ten, PO twenty, PO thirty, right? So it will have the shortest path. So it will have its tree built in the fabric path routing table, saying that. I have a tree and the interfaces. Now the first tree is saying that it goes to fabric path uh, to the switch ID of uh, switch ID 10 with uh, on port channel 10, right? And again, it will have another entry for all the destinations. So across the equal cost multipath links, right? So it will have an entry of port channel 10, port channel 20, port channel 30. Right? So at this point, it will try to broadcast the frame. Right? So what will the broadcast frame look like? Now the broadcast frame will look like, let me draw it with a different color. The broadcast frame will look like, um, this is on the switch 100 towards switch 10. Right, so it will look like destination address as FF, right? It will set the F tag as one because it's sending a broadcast right now, right? Uh, within the tree, uh, it will set the destination MAC address. I mean, below is the payload, right? The so destination MAC address as FF. I mean, the same stuff that we had here. It will come down here. Right, so it got encapsulated over here. Um, it will also have an entry of um, the source address. So now the switch ID uh, of 100 is the source address. So it will say that source address is 100. It's not having any VPC, so the sub switch ID is zero. And say for it has um, the LID as 100. Oh, sorry, not 100, make it 10. Or any 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 random value, say um, six, right? So it says that the source address is hundred dot zero dot six, right? So it knows from where the packet came in. This is the port which it says, okay, the packet is coming from this point. All right. So now the frame reaches the switch ID hundred. It's also a multi-destination tree, right? So in the multi-destination tree, like this guy had its own routing table and the tree built up, it will also have its tree built up, right? So it will have entries like, um, one entry will have towards, say, this side is having uh, port channel 100, port channel 200, port channel 300, right? It will have the entry of port, port channel 100, port channel 200, port channel 300, right? And then it will also have um, another entry for port channel 100, the shortest path towards, back towards this point, right? So at this point, it's, it's actually the broadcast ARP request, and it is supposed to go out of all the interfaces. So after it has reached to this point, it is going to forward across the packets to all the um, um, all the um, um, entries in the first entry, right? So since the packet was here as well, here as well, here as well, is not going to it is going to drop the packet on this node, whereas on this node and this node is going to reach here. Now as soon as the packet is reach to this point at to um, switch 400, right? So what it'll do is it will have its own, um, as I said, uh, the tree built. The tree will have entries like one towards all the spine switches, right? Sorry. Spine switches, so S10, Sorry, port channel 10, 20, 
30, right? So it has 10, 20, and 30. It will have one entry for that, and it will have one entry towards this point switch 30. So for channel 30, right? The same way, the same process that was happened on the left side of the topology, it's happening on the right side of the topology. Now, after the frame has reached to this point, right, it is going to decapsulate here and see that where's the the source MAC of A was there, and the destination MAC is FF, right? Remember, at this point, the MAC table is not going to be formed, right? It is not going to be formed. So after this guy has reached over here, the frame has reached over here, it's going to respond back in this manner. So in the response back, let me use another color so that it becomes more understandable. Right, now returning path, the packet will look like uh, the destination MAC is A, the source MAC is now B, and the payload, right? And the same process here. So it has built its MAC table now here, right? That it has learned over this interface. Now, when it reaches to this point, right, it knows that it has this tree over here available. So it will go to the point for channel 30, right, for channel 20 and for channel 10, because the first entry is towards all the port channels, right? After it has sent the packets to everywhere, right, what it will say is, the multi-destination point um, tree is already there, so it is going to reach back to the switch ID of A, right? And when it reaches here, it knows it knows where its routing is, our routing table is built, right? At this point, when the packet is forwarded back from here to all the rest of the nodes based on the port, uh, the the routing table, the fabric path routing table, it will have uh, this kind of entry. So the destination MAC, the DA address will be. Uh, one one question. Yeah. Why doesn't it send the reply back from the port it received instead of multicasting it to uh, to sending it to everybody? Because it doesn't know. Um, where it needs to send the packet. It hasn't built its own table yet, right? You can okay. only see the MAC address of B. It's a good question, right? You understand that, I mean, unicast forwarding only takes place when you have both the source and the destination MAC address. Unless you have that, it is not really possible to have the unicast forwarding take place, correct? Make sense? Yes, it does. Okay, okay, yeah. So now it knows that when it forwards the packet over here, it says that the destination address is um, of the multi multiple channels. Um, it's coming up the multiple um, um, destination addresses from here itself because the packet, when it's sent from this guy to this guy, it already has framed as packet in a different way, right? So over here, when switch ID 400 sent across the packet to all the uplinks or the spine switches, it said that um, its DA address is MC, right? F tag is pointing to one, right? The source address is similar way that we formed over here, right? Hundred dot um, zero dot six. So it might have something like uh, three hundred or sorry, four hundred dot uh, zero dot uh, say ten or eleven, whatever value uh, it may have populated when it's stable. Right, and at the bottom of it, it will have the same uh, packet that it was sending. So that is encapsulated. 
right? From there on, um, the same packet will be received here and will be sent across to the switch 100. Now, when the switch 100 receives it, it is then going to populate its um, F, I mean, based on the F tag, it knows that it is coming out of port channel 10 because it already has its routing entry built. And then it is going to pop populate its MAC address table, right, saying that the B is learned over 300, uh, 400.0.10. Make sense? This is how it will look like in the MAC address table. This MAC address table is only populated within the MAC address table when the destination MAC address is known. Now, when is the destination MAC address known? Remember, the destination MAC address now is A, and this destination MAC address was already populated in the MAC address when the packet was originally sent. This is how it is going to build up its MAC table. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, it is. So once it, it has reached to this point, it will have an entry of 400.0.10, right? Then it knows where it needs to send the packet. No questions. Then all the unicast forwarding will take place. All right. So, um, any any questions so far? No, that was an excellent explanation. Thank you. All right. So, um, I think uh, I explained uh, the one part of it. Now, if you think logically, uh, and if you recall that this side of the MAC address table is not completely populated, right? It is only populated for the MAC address B. So next time it tries to send a frame for in uh, sourcing from A to B, the same logic will apply for populating the MAC table. The MAC address table will only be populated when the de destination MAC, addre uh, MAC address is found in the MAC table. So now when this guy sends a frame, the destination MAC is going to be B, right? And this guy already knows B. So it is then it is going to populate its scam table or the MAC table saying that the other entry will look like on this guy. The first entry of B was like um, uh, B was learned over Ethernet 2 slash 1, say. And now it will populate an entry saying that A is learned over 100.0.6. Um, also the same one that we said? Yeah. Right? This is how both know each other and then the unicast forwarding will take place. Right? So, um, I know it's a bit uh, complex thing, but yeah, I mean, once you start playing around with the devices, it, uh, devices, it will become easier and uh, you will learn more. So definitely um, a hands-on will be required. So any further questions or uh, shall we move to the demonstration? Let's move to the demonstration. Okay, all right. So let me stop the screen sharing. <laughs> 